Hi everyone, and welcome to today's Red Hat webinar. Before we get started with today's presentation, there are a few items to quickly mention. You should see a taskbar at the bottom of the screen. Each icon is assigned to a particular element of today's webinar. If you're not sure what the icon does, hop over the icon with your mouse, and a box will appear to tell you the function. Also, next to the slides window, you should see a blank Ask a Question box that allows you to type a question. After you type the question, click Submit to send it to our presenters. Feel free to submit questions throughout the webinar, and our presenters will address as many as possible following the presentation. You can submit any technical questions related to the webinar platform here. Please close down other browser windows or applications that might be splitting your bandwidth, including VPNs, as these might interfere with the audio or video stream. If you experience any connectivity issues, please refresh your browser. Today's session is being recorded, and all registrants will receive an email within one to two days of the event with a link to view this presentation on demand. Now I'm going to hand it over to today's first speaker so we can get started with the presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, this is Jamie Duncan. Uh, thanks for everyone on the East Coast braving the bad weather to dial in, if not in person. Uh, sorry, I'm a, a little captured by the snow myself. I live in Virginia on the East Coast, and uh, we're, we're a little snowed in. So if my audio is a little weird or if I get a little, if it blanks in and out a little bit, bear with me. Um, I'm not in the office. I'm actually in my home office. So apologies if, if the audio isn't quite what it normally is. Again, my name is Jamie Duncan. Here's the title slide. Uh, today we're going to be talking about storage inside the OpenShift container platform from Red Hat. Um, we're going to talk about storage from a couple of different angles. Uh, before we get started, again, Jamie Duncan is my name. Uh, there's my Twitter handle. Uh, my email, cloudguy at redhat.com. Uh, if I haven't run into you at a conference before or at some meeting or some meetup group, a little bit about me. I've been at Red Hat a little over six years. Uh, the vast majority of that time I've been working with our public sector customers in the federal government space. Uh, that's a picture of my daughter, Elizabeth. She is the cutest thing ever. Uh, there she's probably eating a not quite healthy Sonic corn dog, but she thought, thought it was pretty awesome. And the last thing I'd go in there, and this little bit of a shameless plug, uh, today we're talking about OpenShift. Specifically, we're talking about storage and OpenShift. Um, but uh, I do have a book coming out, actually coming out here in just the next few weeks uh, from Manning Publications, OpenShift in Action. Uh, and here in just a couple of slides, um, I'll plug that one more time and actually give anyone listening who's interested in it and wants to get a deeper dive into OpenShift uh, all the way down to the bottom of the Linux kernel, uh, a discount code for that. So, again, been at Red Hat about six years. I do have the cutest kid on the planet, uh, and I've been up nights for the past year or so trying to crank out this book about OpenShift. Um, like I said earlier, we're going to be working, talking specifically about storage today. I don't have a – I didn't want to break this down into huge, long uh, – into 14 or 15 different points. We've only got about 12 or 13 slides today. So I don't know if that's going to take, you know, 40 minutes or 20 minutes, um, but – I wanted to try to keep storage as as, as straightforward as possible. Um, if you've ever heard me talk before, if we've ever had a discussion, you'll know that I'm a huge proponent of fundamental knowledge. Um, I think before we, we start to do all sorts of crazy, fancy stuff, we need to understand the why and the how of what's going on. And, and I think that's incredibly true for storage inside any container platform or any application platform. So today I wanted to keep it. Um, I won't say high level because we're actually going to be talking about the, the lowest level, the most basic fundamental knowledge around how storage works in Kubernetes, uh, how that's leveraged by OpenShift, uh, and then take that a couple of steps higher and talk about a couple of different ways storage can work. And then one particular storage solution that, that I'm a huge fan of and we're finding a, a huge acceptance in, in the container community, uh, and in particular Red Hat customers, we'll talk about container native storage. Uh, then whether that takes 20 minutes or 40 minutes, however long it takes, um, we'll have as much time as, as left on the hour uh, for any kind of Q&A that we want to have. Um, like they said at the beginning, if you have a question, please put it into the, into the question field on the webinar page, and we'll go through them all at the tail end. Um, unfortunately, webinars are hard to make very interactive because we're not sitting in the same room, uh, so we'll just do all of the questions at one point, at one, at one time. So we're going to focus on storage today, but I can't talk about storage inside OpenShift without giving at least a quick talk or at least paying homage 
to what OpenShift is. Um, if you've heard the word Docker or container or Kubernetes or any of those things, those are, you know, containers are, are fundamentally changing how IT is done, uh, in, especially in the enterprise world, but really everywhere. Um, I'm seeing containers pop up in high-performance computing and scientific computing. Uh, in, in edge use cases, uh, such as, you know, government agencies you know, on the backs of, of military vehicles, they're running stuff in containers um, all across the telco space. Containers are everywhere, and they are changing how we do our jobs. They're changing how IT is done. Um, I don't like the buzzwords very much, but I was reading Twitter uh, just before we got started, and someone was, was off on a big, long rant again about how Kubernetes is the next operating system, you know, the operating system for the cloud. And while that's not accurate for a lot of reasons that get my, my geek hackles up, uh, the idea is, is really pretty true. Um, so kind of walking down this slide from top to bottom, from high to low, um, OpenShift is Red Hat's enterprise-grade application platform. It's based on containers. Uh, so all of the applications inside OpenShift run inside containers. Kubernetes, which is the tool invented by Google, and I don't want to get down deep into the history of it, um, but we'll just leave it at, at Kubernetes is the de facto standard for creating clusters of servers to run containers. Kubernetes is at the core of OpenShift. Uh, Red Hat is at the core of Kubernetes. Uh, there's, you know, there's all these slides going around, all of this, this social media going around where Red Hat is, is in leadership or co-leadership of, I think, 11 of the special interest groups uh, that make up Kubernetes, as well as several of the, the more advanced working groups. Um, so Kubernetes is, is at the heart of OpenShift, and Red Hat is at the heart of Kubernetes. Uh, we we have hundreds of engineers working on it every day. Um, don't want to dive into that. I'm assuming if you want to talk about storage with OpenShift, um, then you already know what OpenShift is. But if you do want to get deeper into OpenShift and, and all the way down to the bottom of it, um, while today's not a deep dive, uh, Red Hat Summit's coming up in just a few weeks, May 8th, out in San Francisco. Uh, last time I looked, there were 100 plus sessions specific to OpenShift and containers. Uh, and there's a link. Uh, you know, all you have to do is Google Red Hat Summit 2018, and you'll get all of the links that you want. Hundreds of sessions on OpenShift, of which I'm working on a couple of the labs and have one of the sessions uh, with one of our chief engineers, Dan Walsh. Uh, if you can go, if you can get into a Dan Walsh session, I highly recommend it. They're actually hard to get into. Uh, several of his sessions have already been wait, uh, waitlisted, uh, and Summit is still about a month and a half away. So I don't want to get too deep into it, but I do want to sort of the overarching value of containers, and we're going to come back to this towards the end. This is a graphic from, from OpenShift in Action. This is actually the first graphic in Chapter 2. Um, OpenShift and, and Kubernetes and, 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 by extension, OpenShift, take a very complex task of putting an application, creating a container for an application, deploying that container across a cluster of servers, making that cluster of servers available through a simple URL, and then managing its lifecycle effectively, managing code updates, managing container-based image updates, managing all of those things. All of it just works out of the box. Now, we certainly aren't going to sit and go through all of these boxes uh, on this slide. Um, because there are lots of them, and it would take up way more than the time we have allotted today. Uh, just making this graphic alone took uh, way more time than I want, I care to admit. But you can see it at a high level. At one end, we have developers creating source code and triggering application builds. And at the other side, we have application users talking to a different part of OpenShift and actually consuming that application uh, very quickly, very efficiently. And what is what we're going to talk about today towards the tail end when we kind of have our conclusions in a transportable fashion um there was a I, I was i used to use the word portable when we talked about containers and that you would have a, a container image or a container you had a portable workload i could take my workload and i could move it from one place to another um i had a very smart person at one point tell me you know explain to me why it's not portable it's transportable that it could be moved, but it wasn't 100% effective uh, depending on where you moved it. And that's one of those problems, one of the reasons it's not 100% portable, it's transportable, it can be moved, uh, but it's not guaranteed to work depending on what OpenShift cluster you move it to 
is because of storage. Um, storage is storage is hard on its best day. Uh, you know, if you work, if, you know, I'm assuming everyone on here is an IT professional. Um, you know, we have entire teams dedicated to storage. There's a multi-billion dollar industry just to do storage effectively and reliably and to provide an SLA around it. So to do that, to, to take the sort of the, the turning on its head of, of the container revolution that we've all been going through the past four years and to make storage work effectively with that, it's really hard. Um, if you look at this graphic, there are nowhere do we talk about storage at all. Um, we have an entire chapter dedicated to storage in the book, but it, it didn't make it into here because there's so many ways to do it. There's so many, it, it's such a complex animal um, to bring it in effectively. Now, you know, standing up an NFS server and letting my container talk to it, you know, for a demo, that's easy. That's pretty straightforward. But to do it at scale, to do it ready for production, to do it at the scales that we need to do, to be able to say an application is ready for production traffic in our world, in the enterprise world, um, it's a really complex animal. And, and that's where, that's the, that's the thing I want to try to tackle today in the time we have left over. Um, again, I promise the shameless plug number two, here it is. Um, open, if you could, uh, this discount code actually works through, I'm told, the end, uh, through mid-June. 40% uh, off the book, if that's of interest to you, um, please feel free to take advantage of it. Um, I won't say that I get a ton of cash off of that, but I do get a, you know, it is my book. Um, but it's, it's a good one. Uh, and we've, it's gone through a lot of QA. We've had a lot of really smart people read it and had a lot of really smart people help us put it together. Um, the one thing I will say about OpenShift in Action is it's the first time we've tried, that anyone has tried to talk about developers, how developers use OpenShift, use Kubernetes, and how operations use OpenShift, use Kubernetes. Um, we go for each, cha each chapter, each topic that we, we tackle, uh, be it you know, CI, CD workflows, or security or how namespaces work inside the Linux kernel, we go all the way down to the bottom of all of it. Um, it was a lot of fun to write, uh, but it was, you know, took a lot of work. It's kind of a different angle on it, at least we hope it is. So that's all for the shameless plugs. Now let's get to talking about storage a little more effectively. Yep. So I tried my best to put these 13 slides together and not use the word DevOps. But the idea of containers, the idea of Kubernetes and OpenShift are just intrinsically tied um, to the DevOps mentality, the DevOps philosophy of getting work done. And the reason I say that they're, they're sort of, they're just completely tethered to one another is because for the first time, or I guess the most effective way, um, at least I've seen how to do how to do DevOps, and, and I hate saying that phrase, but I, I can't think of a better one to say. How to realize the DevOps philosophy? How to bring DevOps into any organization? People talk about all you know. There are manifestos, and there are, are philosophies, and there are entire books written about DevOps. In my experience, the people who are doing DevOps the best in their world, in their enterprise, in their in their company, in their organization. It makes developers have to be bad admins less often, and it makes admins have to be bad developers less often. DevOps provides a good, solid separation of concerns. It gives me a solid stopping point and a solid starting point from where different teams' responsibilities start and end. Um, to me, that's the most important aspect of what, of what DevOps does. And the best way we found yet to realize that, to give a solid separation, to give a nice line of demarcation for what we're doing, is using Kubernetes in, inside OpenShift. Everything inside Kubernetes, including storage, um, has the separation of concerns where we separate the control plane from the data plane. Um, the control plane is controlled by the ops, the admin team. Uh, the, these are the control plane inside Kubernetes, inside OpenShift, are all of the cluster-wide components and resources. So things like, how is my networking configured? What, what access do I have to what storage resources? What are each project that I deploy inside OpenShift, what are the maximum resources it can consume? Uh, and then for any application, what are the max resources that, can, that a single application inside a project can consume? 
Uh, so those things, and, and a lot of security, and I just ran out of space on this slide, but security concerns, who has permissions, to do that, how, you're, you know, how you're handling role-based access control, all of those things that affect the entire cluster are controlled by the operations team. And they're controlled completely, completely invisibly to the data plane. The data plane is all of the workloads. The data plane are all of the applications deployed inside OpenShift. Um, everything inside a given project, everything created by a developer on OpenShift is what we would call the data plane. And the data plane consumes all of the resources in the control plane. So there has to be communication, and, and that idea of, of DevOps and enhancing communication, all of that comes into play because you're, if you're control plane isn't doing what your data plane needs, then your applications won't work correctly. But that idea that you can do whatever you want in the data plane, here are the rules and the regulations that I'm going to impose on you to, to meet my security concerns, to meet my compliance concerns, to interface with my external services like storage um, effectively. But as long as you follow this list, these rules that I'm gonna lay out in the control plane, you can go do whatever you want. Um, as long as what you're doing is, of course, within compliance and security and all of that fun stuff. But that separation of concerns, we have to talk about before we talk about storage. Uh, because what storage, storage leverages that uh, very heavily inside OpenShift. So everything, and I'm kind of bouncing around here. Uh, when we put this idea for this talk together, I wasn't sure I know that if we walk down to the bottom of all these concepts, that we would this would be a three-hour webinar, and I wouldn't want anyone to suffer through three hours of me talking. Uh, I'm pretty sure 40 or 45 minutes is bad enough. But I, so I have to make some assumptions about what you know. Um, if you if any of these points fall on on your ears and, and there are things you're not aware of or things you want to know a little more of, please put a question in the Q&A, and and we'll do our best to get to them. Um, but everything inside Kubernetes is a plugin. Uh, there's a plugin to put in your software-defined networking layer for all your all of your containers to talk on. There's a plugin there's a plugin architecture to run whichever container runtime you want. Um, I don't know if you know this, but there's more than one container there's more than one container runtime. Uh, Docker was the first, uh, but Docker is certainly not the last, and Docker may not be the best. Um, Docker is, is Still, the currently is still the default container runtime for OpenShift, but it's not the only one it ships with. Uh, there's a, a container runtime called Cryo that, that's out there that a lot of people are working on uh, that will be eventually the default container runtime in OpenShift. Um, we're not getting rid of Docker, but we're going to make it not the default for a lot of different reasons. Um, again, Dan Walsh, if, if you want any more information about that, uh, one of Dan's sessions at Summit, or just Dan Walsh's Twitter feed will give you everything you need to know. But just like everything else in Kubernetes, storage uses an interface or a plugin architecture where you can write plugins for different for different types of storage backends for a Kubernetes to interface with. So when an application says, I need to provision a, a piece of storage, I need to make a request for a piece of storage. Uh, depending on what you have configured in your container storage interface, uh, Kubernetes is able to talk to that provider of storage and create the, and create the resource as needed uh, or interact with the resource as needed, depending on what level, and we'll get to that here in a couple of minutes. Uh, Red Hat's OpenShift supports 13. One, two, three. Yeah, 13. Uh, I always make sure there are 11. Uh, there's 11 uh, plugins for different identity providers and 13 plugins for storage. And I always think of it, I have them backwards. But we have 13 different storage providers uh, that we have that we support out of the box with OpenShift. Um, that's not an exhaustive list. Uh, there are third-party plugins that handle storage for Kubernetes and OpenShift that have their own plugins. Uh, the first one that springs to mind is Portworks. I um, was talking with those gentlemen last week about how their technology works. It's some really interesting technology. Uh, but since it's their plugin, they provide the support for it. We don't ship it out of the box with OpenShift. Um, obviously, NFS, which I've already mentioned, saying it was not production ready, and we'll get to that question here on the tail end. Um, 13, different, 13 different storage plugins. And 
storage is required for exactly why you think it's required. Um, for cloud native applications, it's not quite as essential because most of your cloud native, most of the, you know, if you're doing the microservices thing, if you're building out applications uh, that that consume, that is broken down, decomposed into multiple services, not all of them would need to write to disk. Not all of them need persistent storage. So persistent storage isn't as large a problem. Um, for those applications, they certainly need persistent storage, and this is the way you get it. Uh, but when persistent storage becomes a, a huge need inside a container platform like OpenShift is when you're bringing in legacy applications. When you're bringing in applications that in the past have assumed they have a full operating system, that they have, that they can write files into the slash temp directory, and that those files would survive a service restart or a reboot, that they're writing files into their own directories, be it for user data or just to manage state and manage information. Um, any application, you know, any legacy application that uses that mentality heavily, and there are thousands of them out there, or millions, excuse me, millions of them out there, uh, persistent storage becomes a huge thing. A huge thing. And what happens, uh, storage, you know, the storage interface is part of that control plane. The operations team configures one or more storage provider inside their OpenShift cluster and makes them available to the end users. So I want to break that down into how that request works because we've talked about that separation of concerns and we know that the operations team, the control plane, they attach, they tell OpenShift which storage plugins to use but how does that request actually happen? So when I have an application that actually needs persistent storage, how does that request look like? Um, because it's not, it's not as cut and dry. It is a little different than it would be in the legacy world. You don't just go carve off a, a LUN on your SAN or you don't just create a new export on your NetApp. It is a little different. So breaking it down a little bit, and this is a very simplistic view of it, but there are two components in, that we have to talk about when we're, when we're attaching persistent storage to an application inside OpenShift. There are two terms we have to know. Um, the first one is a persistent volume. The persistent volume represents a volume from the storage provider. So for an NFS, if I were using NFS as my storage provider, it would be an NFS export. Um, if it were elastic block storage from Amazon, it would be an EBS volume. My persistent volume represents a piece of storage for that can be consumed by my OpenShift cluster. Uh, that storage has a few attributes attached to it, and I didn't have room for them on this slide, but we have the ability to have storage classes, which I'll, I'll mention again here in a little bit. Um, storage classes, I can have, a storage class is just a, an arbitrary label. Um, storage classes can be, you know, dev, prod, test. Storage classes can be fast, slow, um, gold, silver, bronze, whatever makes business sense to me. But I can assign different persistent volumes, different storage providers, different classes of storage. I think it's really helpful if I'm using a large external server, uh, external appliance like a NetApp, where I have some spinning disk, some flash, uh, different types of storage, different speeds of storage. So the system volume, I have a storage class, and then obviously the size, the amount of storage uh, that, it, that it's going to consume, and then the type of storage. Um, if we look back at that list of 13 different providers, the different providers have different types of access. Uh, for example, NFS is a network attached file system. That means multiple servers, multiple containers can mount and read and write from that volume, from that NFS export simultaneously. Uh, and NFS is going to handle all of the write locking and read and read locking and all of that fun stuff for me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that means I can have an access mode where I can have, if I had, say, for instance, an NFS share that I was using as as a persistent volume, I would have I would ha be able to let multiple containers use it simultaneously. So I could have rewrite many access mode we call it. Whereas if I had an elastic block volume, you know. To, from Amazon in EBS volume as a persistent volume, only one virtual machine can mount that EBS volume at a time. It's just a limitation of how Amazon builds out their infrastructure. That means only one container can have that mounted at, at a time, which means I could only, it would be an access mode of read-write once. So the storage could persist. So if container A was using it and container A died, I could create a new copy of container A and it could reuse that storage 
or down the road, if I got rid of application A, container A, I could spin up application B, and application B could use the same EBS volume, but they couldn't use it at the same time. Um, again, those limitations, the access mode limitations, um, are just dependent on what the storage, what storage plugin you're using, the underlying storage technology. Uh, and then the second term we need to talk about is a PVC, a persistent volume claim. That, that's the data plane request. So, that, so the control plane is my persistent volume. My operations team creates, they use whatever storage provider they're going to use out of that 13 list, or if they want to partner with a third party, uh, the list gets significantly longer. But they take, they take their storage that they want to consume in their OpenShift cluster, and they create volumes, and then they associate those volumes with persistent volumes uh, inside OpenShift, and that's how OpenShift tracks them. When an application needs persistent storage, it makes a persistent volume claim. And the persistent volume claim is part of the application's template, part of its definition. Um, that definition includes how much storage it's going to need and what type of access mode it's going to need. So what happens in this very simple diagram is if an application needed a persistent volume, it, made a, it would make a persistent volume claim. And that persistent volume claim would make the best match that it could make from the available volumes. So if if my persistent volume claim was for read write many or read write one storage and I needed two gigabytes of it for my application, I'm, OpenShift is going to look at the available persistent volumes and make the best fit that it can make. So the the best match giving at least that that performance. Uh, and the same for storage classes. So if I made a, a request for two gigs of read write once volume a read write once persistent storage and the best fit was a read write many volume uh, and it was four terabytes that's what it would get so there are certainly some limitations to that um, it has to be that means that what that means is since it's a best fit model I could I very easily get into a situation where I'm wasting storage where my application only needs two gig but I'm giving it ten um, where or, or some scenario like that. Bear with me one second. Okay. All right, so there are better ways to do that, obviously. Um, if you have a storage team and the storage team is doing everything they need and you want to keep that up, that can be a great scenario for you. External storage, we call it container ready storage. Um, using external storage as your provider, you still have to create all those volumes. So if I'm using a NetApp, I have to export them using whatever a NetApp is or, or whatever my storage solution is. Um, maintenance, cleanup, backing up, uh, for platform care and feeding, all of those things still exist. Um, that's, a, that's still a problem. I have to have a whole team to, to handle that for me. And that's not always the best scenario. So. We have sort of a middle a middle of the road idea inside OpenShift, and I didn't really I didn't think we'd have time to get into it very very deeply, but we have external storage. We have this idea of dynamic storage provisioners, um, and a dynamic storage provisioner is if the storage plugin, if the if the storage service has an API that it can talk to, for example, um, for example, Amazon's EBS or Azure's File and Disk or Google's Google's persistent disk. Um, if there's an API to talk to, the dynamic provisioner is a script to help with the provisioning. So instead of me having to, when I, my application needs two gigs of storage, having to go out and create the volume and then attach the volume as a persistent volume into OpenShift, that dynamic provisioner will do that for me. Um, I can talk to the API of the storage provider, and there's some on-premises. There are some on-premise storage providers that have dynamic provisioners as well, but the, the provisioning of my storage is done for me. That cleans up some of my problems. Um, that means I don't have to create new volumes by hand. They're going to be created by OpenShift when they're needed, and they're going to be this exact fit. So if my application requests five gigs of storage, the dynamic provisioner will create exactly five gigs of storage. Um, so that creates that helps with the provisioning, but the care and feeding of my platform, uh, backing up, cleaning up unused, the recycle policies that I have, um, none of those problems go away, and I still have to go out and do that. 
or I just end up consuming way more storage and, and I run out of storage or I run out of money, one or the other. And there, so there's a third solution, and that's where I wanted to spend the last 10 or 15 minutes of what we're talking about today. We can actually run persistent storage inside OpenShift. And by inside OpenShift, I mean literally inside OpenShift. Um, we call it container-native storage. Um, container-native storage, it's, it's a really interesting idea. We've supported it now for, I guess, a little over a year. Um, it's just a lot of really tested and vetted and tried and true technologies. And I want to walk through what that looks like. So as opposed to that very simple picture where I had a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim, the workflow gets a little more complex. And we'll take a look at this here. Um, but what I'm doing, and, and I'll have this in bullet list form here in just a second on the next slide, um, it, when an application makes a request for storage, when the application makes that persistent volume claim, the application through OpenShift talks to another, a container running inside OpenShift called Hecate. And Hecate is just an application. Uh, it's an application that has an API. So OpenShift talks to Hecate. And Hecate, in turn, talks to Gluster containers. Gluster is Red Hat's, one of Red Hat's software-defined storage solutions. So we actually have Gluster running in containers inside OpenShift. And those containers are using disks or using volumes from whatever your platform is deployed on. So if you're on Amazon, those JBOD, those just bunch of disks, would be Amazon EBS volumes. If you're on your own data center, they would just be disks or bare metal or inside VMware virtual machines. They're, just, they're, they're virtual disks or physical disks associated to your OpenShift nodes uh, when you create, when you deploy them. So you deploy Gluster is deployed on some number of your nodes, uh, some number, an um, odd number greater than three, which is just a requirement for how Gluster works. And everything is, happens for you. So when you make that persistent volume claim request, the Hecate API talks to Gluster, which is managing those disks on your system to provide software-defined storage, and creates your persistent volume and associates it with your persistent volume claim automatically. So it acts like a dynamic provisioner in that respect. It also handles all the cleanup. So when you get rid of an application, if you have that storage flagged as, as to delete the storage on termination, it goes away and it's automatically reclaimable. There are a handful of benefits here. Obviously, not having an external storage platform is a big one, but walking through a couple of bullet points here. Gluster runs in containers inside my OpenShift cluster. Those containers are managed by OpenShift itself. So the same Kubernetes scheduler that is managing all of my applications also manages my storage containers. Uh, those containers, those Gluster storage containers, mount disks using whatever my platform provides. So again, on Amazon, it would be EBS, it would be disks on physical systems. Uh, Paketti acts as an interpreter, taking the persistent volume claim request from an application in OpenShift and talking to Gluster to create a Gluster volume and display and, and export the Gluster volume and attach the Gluster volume as a persistent volume in OpenShift and then associate that persistent volume with my persistent volume claim automatically from my application. Um, storage classes, like we already talked about, where I can have any arbitrary types of storage classes, um, I can use those with container-native storage and get different ways to segregate and consume my storage providers in different applications. Uh, for example, using storage classes, I can make sure that all of the applications deployed to certain servers are always deployed to the applications that want to use a certain class of storage are always deployed to the servers where that storage class, where those disks live. And that means I can, I can programmatically, just by defining the storage class in, so using container-native storage, using CNS, just by setting the storage class, it, again, if I have all of my stuff set up correctly, I can make sure that the storage for my, the persistent storage for my applications is running on the same server that my application is running on. And it doesn't matter how big my OpenShift cluster is, whether my OpenShift cluster is five nodes or 500, I can programmatically make sure that's always true. That means my storage is running on the same server 
as my application, that hyper-converged experience that we all look for. Because storage running on the same system is the closest storage, which means it's going to be almost always the fastest storage. Um, after the initial configuration, the initial configuration and deployment takes about 20 minutes on most OpenShift clusters. The processes are 100% automated. Um, when I scale up my, my OpenShift cluster, I can add more. I can flag more of those nodes as being part of my container native storage cluster. Um, and again, it's all just con in, for Haketi to, to, to handle all of that deployment of cluster. It's just editing a configuration file. That's all. When I grow my OpenShift cluster, I add more. I add that information into my Haketi cluster, and it updates. Into, I'm sorry, into my Haketi config file, and my cluster farm inside my OpenShift cluster just grows out, which means my storage scales in the exact same rate that my container platform scales at. Um, oh, container native storage can run anywhere OpenShift can run. Um, that means it can run anywhere RHEL can run. Uh, container native storage is using Gluster at the end of the day. Gluster is a Red Hat product. Um, that means it's all we all know it's going to work. We all it's all tested, it's all vetted, it's all production ready. Gluster has been running production workloads upwards of the, upwards of a decade. Um, we have you know a long list of success stories, so we know Gluster is ready for prime time, and we support Red Hat OpenShift up to 2,000 nodes. Uh, running up to 250 containers per node, so you can run a pretty massive, a pretty massive OpenShift cluster, and have a proven, reliable, fast storage solution just cooked into it. It's a pretty awesome thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I know I've been talking for a long time. I've been talking for about 40 minutes now. All right, about yeah, right at 40 minutes. And I want to get to a Q&A. I've seen a few questions pop up. Um, so just sort of one last, one last conclusion slide, um, and then we'll get into the Q&A. So kind of conclusions and discussions, trying to wrap the past 40 minutes up into, into one list of bullet points, one nutshell. Um, OpenShift is the industry-leading application platform. Uh, we have data and facts to back that up. Um, Kubernetes is the beating heart of OpenShift. Uh, Red Hat is the number two contributor to Kubernetes, um, but Kubernetes is still a project. Um, Kubernetes in and of itself is not production ready, uh, is not a production application. Um, OpenShift takes Kubernetes and brings all of the other components that it needs, like software-defined networking, software-defined storage using container-native storage, uh, a routing layer for applications, requests to get in and out of it and makes it a production-ready and enterprise-grade application. Um, all of the resources inside OpenShift, and I have a little grammatical error there, apologies, all resources inside OpenShift utilize the separation of concerns that makes DevOps a practical reality. Um, my, I don't have to, my admins don't have to be bad, bad developers, and my developers don't have to be bad admins. We have the separation of concerns. We have the control plane and the data plane that work in concert and people don't have to cross over nearly as often. Um, storage and OpenShift can take on a lot of looks. And, and I say that because there are, there are a lot of ways I can handle storage inside OpenShift. Um, it, the most simple way, I can have a completely external service, and my container can just mount whatever that service is when it's created. Um, on the other end, and what we're seeing, and, and again, what we're seeing is customers, uh, is our customers take OpenShift into production, and as they, as they bring this, as their ideas around containers and how they're going to use containers, as they evolve and as they get production ready, we're seeing more and more customers use container native storage. Um, because of the hyper-converged idea, because of the ability to scale with my cluster, um, because of the, the speed and, and the lack of care and feeding that it needs. Um, once, I, once I deploy it the first time, once I configure it, it just goes. Uh, and it go and it's treated like any other application inside my OpenShift cluster. Um, it just happens that this application is serving persistent storage for the other application. And I guess the overarching idea, the thing that I want to toss in there, the the last kind of point I want to drive home, when containers exploded about four years ago, one of the key 
ideas, one of that key ideas was I could take my container and as long as I had the container runtime, I could run my application container anywhere I wanted. And that's true until you start consuming different kinds of persistent storage. And what Kubernetes and OpenShift do is they abstract that away. So instead of having to define in my application that I need to take my application and attach it to an EBS volume and do all of the things that I need to do there, my storage, my application just makes a request for storage. And then on the control plane side, my control plane takes that, that request for storage, that persistent volume claim, and interprets it, takes what's available to it, which persistent storage is available to it, and marries the two together. Um, but depending on the limitations of the storage solution that I'm using, and again, all of the different ones have different capabilities, just depending on what they are, I could still, even though I'm abstracting away that request, uh, the abilities of the storage still creep their way through. Um, and I don't have a truly transportable workflow if I'm depending on that. Um, when my storage is part of my OpenShift cluster, that idea changes. The idea that my storage is running as part of my OpenShift cluster inside the cluster itself means that, yes, I, if I were to if I deployed my OpenShift cluster in Amazon and then went and deployed the same, uh, an identical cluster in my own data center, one could be on physical systems and, and just use disks where the other one would use EBS volumes. But once I deployed that, you know, to, to OpenShift, they would just be disks. To OpenShift, they would be identical. And to OpenShift, since I'm putting cluster on top of them, the capabilities of the storage would be identical even though the storage could be, the storage plugin, the underlying storage could be completely different. Um, I, I'm still, I could still take that storage and make and, and provide a completely seamless experience for my teams, for my data plane. Uh, it's, a really, it's a really pretty cool thing. Um, it's a technology that, that's getting a, a lot of traction, uh, a, lot of, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of uptake in our customers here over the last, the last year or 18 months. Uh, it's it's ready for prime time at this point. So those are the the points I kind of wanted to stammer through today. Um, I've seen a few questions pop in. Kind of get to the last call to action slide. Um, this is a again this is a, a little heads up about how to to get out the summit. Um, oh, there's another promotional code for you. Another another coupon code. Um, using webinar 18, uh, you get a discount on your summit registration if you haven't already registered. Um, I want to get into some of these questions. I've seen a few of them. Um, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom. There was one I wanted to handle first because it's a statement I made, but I didn't qualify it. Um, someone asked, uh, why is NFS not production ready? And I, I'm, a, look, I'm as big an NFS fan on the planet as anyone. I've used it forever. Um, In particular, in containers, it runs into some problems. Um, the first one, or the one, the biggest one, <laughs> and, and we discovered, or at least I discovered it very early when trying to use NFS as a container registry storage. If I, just because of the caching mechanisms inside of NFS, if I talk to container A to send to upload a, a large data file, and then I sent the request to confirm that it was written in container B, um, the request would often error out because part of the file was still in the buffer in container A. And it doesn't matter what options I set on my, from my client side, what options I set in my NFS server, and what like affinity options I set inside, open, inside Kubernetes or inside OpenShift, that, pro that sort of problem still exists. Um, it's not designed, it, it's, it's not session safe in that way. And you run into problems with NFS when you're dealing with production workloads. Um, there's, there are entire blog posts on the topic. There are people that have huge opinions on the topic. Um, that's the example that pops to my mind first. Um, but for a lot of reasons, Red Hat does not recommend using NFS in production with containers. Hopefully that helps a little bit. 
Um, someone asks, Thomas asks, can you do zero downtime upgrades of Gluster? He says Gluster Clusters. Um, I always say Gluster Farms uh, because I hate saying Gluster Cluster because it just gives me a headache. <laughs> but yes, you can do zero downtime. Um, depending on how many replicas of data that you set up, and by default, we recommend three uh, for container native storage, um, you can, you're not degraded for data integrity unless you lost two out of three systems, because you would have three copies of the data across each node. Um, obviously, you can make more copies than that if you wanted to, to get even higher data fidelity. Uh, but yeah, you can totally do zero downtime upgrades with Cluster. Um, you, just have, you do have to schedule it and orchestrate it in an intelligent way using something like Ansible. Um, can I adjust my storage config out of band with Hikedi, or is Hikedi completely stateless bidirectional? I haven't tested it. Um, I think you could. Um, I would not recommend it. Um, it's not a workflow that we, that we document. It's not a workflow that we test. Um, especially when you're talking about container-native storage. Um, from my understanding of how Hikedi communicates with Gluster, it shouldn't hurt anything. Those changes, those out-of-band changes, would be read and, and adapted. Uh, but it could, uh, it could have an adverse effect further. It could have a ripple effect further up the stack into OpenShift for your application. We have about 10 minutes. Aren't these Gluster containers some kind of single point of failure? Um, well, in using container native storage, the Gluster containers run as what are called a daemon set. Uh, a daemon set inside OpenShift, it's a Kubernetes concept where Kubernetes ensures that exactly one replica of the container is running on each, on up to however many hosts you tell it to. Um, again, by default, we recommend at least three, um, but it can be as many as you need. Um, so if one, and, and so when you take that into effect, so I'm, my Gluster farm is stretched across multiple servers. And then with the way Gluster works, where the data is replicated across multiple servers, um, no, there's no single point of failure. Uh, the way the DNS works for requesting the, you know, when I'm when I'm at making a request to, to access storage on my container native storage, uh, the service inside Kubernetes is intelligent enough that if one container goes down, um, not only will it recreate the container on the on the specified node so it can reattach to the to the correct disks and it does all of that cleanly, but it also knows where to go next. So it, it keeps track of all of the servers running my container native storage containers and make sure that everything is there. So while components may come up and down, uh, you wouldn't lose fidelity of data and you wouldn't lose access to your data. What is the backup solution for CNS? Um, I'm gonna hand wave and punt on that one a little bit because the backup solution is completely dependent on the underlying infrastructure. Um, if I were running a CNS inside OpenShift on OpenStack, my backup solution would be completely different than if I were running on bare metal systems or an Amazon. Um, that said, yes, there are backup solutions and they do work just fine, um, but they're so completely dependent on the infrastructure. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a, a soft pass on that one. Apologies, Eric. What persistency is Hikedi using internally? I think it requires an NFS share for its internal database. We had quite some issues with it in light of OpenShift upgrades. Quite possibly. Um, Hikedi, I know for one, um, persists some data into the SED database um, inside OpenShift. SED is a component inside Kubernetes. Um, so it's reading and writing from SED inside Kubernetes, inside OpenShift um, as part of its data persistence. But I think you are correct that there is an NFS share for an internal database that it uses just for, for whatever it's doing, uh, from keeping track of itself. Um, I don't know if that's planned to go away and use purely use SCD, or if it's used, or if there's some need for for two databases there. Um, but I I think you're correct. Um, I know it does have a persistent volume associated with it. 
um, and that's so it does have a need for consuming some sort of state. What version of OpenShift supports Hecate? Um, we started supporting, and don't hold me to this, it's, it's on our official documentation page, but I believe OpenShift 3.4, Container Native Storage, was Tech Preview, which means it was production support ready 3.5 and up. So we're on 3.9 now, so it's been around for a while. Um, why is Red Hat focused on Gluster for this? Will Ceph be supported as well? Um, it's kind of an interesting animal. CephFS is a GA production supported product. Um, in the container community, the CephFS could provide a mount point very similar to Gluster for containers to, to consume. OpenShift is, is very much is, is an enterprise implementation of Kubernetes with a lot of stuff put on top of it, but at its heart, it's Kubernetes. And inside the Kubernetes community, there just aren't a ton of people talking about Ceph yet. Um, I'm guessing that's because CephFS is, is just very new and people haven't been supporting, you know, haven't been looking at it. Um, in theory, Ceph can do the same thing, where we could have, where we could replace Ceph with Gluster down the road. Um, there's just not a lot of community desire for that. Um, if it's something you want to get behind, I would, you know, the, the storage special interest group inside inside the Kubernetes community, I would go talk, I would go take a look at their mailing list. I'd go take a look at their chat rooms and see what their thoughts are on the topic. Um, it's not something I'm tracking every day. Um, someone's plugging, it looks like someone's plugging their own product. So I'm just running through the um, some of these questions I just don't know off the top of my head. Um, we have about five minutes left. Um, if I don't get to your question, apologies. Um, I'll do my best to answer all of these. Some of them I don't know off the top of my head, and I'd want to get some other some other expert inter answer to make sure I, I wouldn't give you bad information. Um, and so I'm just kind of scrolling through these. So if I fall silent for a couple of seconds, apologies. Um, so someone is, is kind of pivoting this idea, uh, talking about Cloud Forms, which is Red Hat's cloud orchestration tooling. I'm not sure we can easily generate billing or chargeback with Cloud Forms. I'm assuming you're talking about OpenShift. Do not partner with anyone who provides that type of functionality. Um, we don't have a partnership with anyone that I know of. Um, I'm certainly not aware of every partner at Red Hat. Um, and the idea, uh, and, uh, and Richard, apologies if I make the wrong assumption here, um, but up until very, or I guess still, it's somewhat limited. Um, up through Cloud Forms 4.5, uh, it was, you couldn't get the granular enough data out of OpenShift to do effective chargeback or chargeback showback. Um, and chargeback is, is a part of Cloud Forms that's been around for a long time. Uh, for virtual machines, it works very well. Um, for different virtual machine providers like Amazon or VMware, it works very well. Uh, but there's some limitations with OpenShift. Um, a lot of those limitations went away in Cloud Forms 4.6, which was GA just relatively recently in the past month. Um, if you haven't in, if you haven't taken a look at that, and if that still doesn't do what you need, um, send me an email, and we can go and take a look and see where exactly the features you need are on the on the roadmap for Cloud Forms. Um, but I saw 4.6 just before GA, and it was it. The information coming out of OpenShift uh, wasn't perfect yet, but a massive improvement over 4.5. Um, should mount should mount PVC with existing NFS server require specified storage size? Um, any persistent volume claim, just as part of what a persistent volume claim of PVC is, has to request a storage size. Um, that's just part of the definition. Um, so you have to request a storage size. You have to request an access mode that read write once, read write many, or read only uh, type of storage. And then optionally, you can request a, sp a specific storage class. So you have to define the size and the access mode, and then you can ask for a specific storage class if you want. 
Um, so yes, uh, all PVCs have to specify the storage size uh, when they make the request for storage. Um, why Gluster versus some other underlying storage agnostic solution? Um, when you look at what it is, uh, when you start breaking down the abilities, uh, when you, you start, you want read, write, many storage. Um, you need it to work across any platform. So it can't be dependent on one particular vendor's hardware or one particular vendor's software. Um, when you start breaking down the requirements for what container native storage wants to be, and that's a, a storage that will work anywhere OpenShift can work. Um, and it needs to provide read, write, many access, and it needs to provide high data fidelity. Um, so I need to have the ability to stretch it across my cluster, across multiple nodes in my cluster, and have multiple copies of that data written. Um, so if I do lose one node, I don't lose my data. I don't lose access to my data um, or parity. Uh, Gluster just jumped out as the best solution. Um, if there is another one out there, um, Haketi is an open source project. Um, Haketi was invented by someone at Red Hat. Um, he has since left the company. He's actually working at a, a startup at a smaller storage company now. I um, spoke with him last week. Um, Haketi is open source. It's out on GitHub. Um, I haven't investigated it. Haketi may be able to use more than one storage platform. Um, it would make it would make sense to me. Red Hat solution, since obviously we own Gluster, we know it very well. We know its capabilities very well. Gluster is what we chose. Um, if you wanted to roll your own style of container native storage, uh, certainly within the realm of possibility. Like I said, Haketi is open source, um, and if I'm not mistaken, Portworx actually uses Haketi as well. Um, just started learning about Portworx last week, but it's another software to find storage or container native storage solution. So there is another one out there. It's just not owned by Red Hat. Uh, the one that I know best, the one that I'm talking about, uh, is, is CNS inside OpenShift. And it looks like we only have about two minutes. OpenShift can. Yeah, so when I was talking about cloud native storage, and this is a pretty good wrapping up point, I think, um, someone was talking about, don't understand why you mentioned applications, if they're cloud native, do not require storage. The totality of a cloud native store application obviously requires storage. Um, an application that, that doesn't need storage is an application that can't do anything. Can't write to a database, can't you know write session data, can't do anything for its end users. When I talk about cloud native applications, I'm talking about applications decomposed into multiple microservice style um, containers or pods. Um, not all of those pods require storage. Um, a lot of them are stateless, just take a request on its API, do some math, and then forward that request to the next service in the chain. Um, those wouldn't require persistent storage. They certainly require ephemeral storage. Um, and that's why I was talking about container, cloud native storage or cloud native applications it's not as big a problem because those applications, not every pod, not every container in those applications that make up those applications require persistent storage, just a subset of them. Whereas a legacy application, typically every container for every legacy application requires stateful storage. Um, and then the last question, uh, do you support Swarm? Uh, the short answer and the total answer is no. Um, Swarm is uh, not supported at all by CNS. So we're right up at the top of the hour. There were a lot of questions I, I couldn't get to, and apologies for that. Um, I'll get this list, and we'll try to farm them out as best we can here over the next day or so. Um, I'm on travel tomorrow, so it may be late this week or early next week before you hear a response from me. But I'll do my best to answer all of these. And, um, and thanks for your time. Um, I hope this was helpful, and, and I hope uh, at least some of you are going to go out and explore container-native storage in the near future. Thanks a lot.